Hello everybody, I'm speaking in hushed tones this morning as the kids are still in bed. But this episode is a recording of the keynote I presented at the Grow CFO Global Finance Summit. In it, I walk you through the now versus future applications of AI and machine learning. We look at why pattern recognition is so important for AI and how it's not perfect, how fruit can be used to train AI models, how machine learning can be used to spot outlier transactions during periodic activities like month end, how I use machine learning to conduct spend and revenue analysis, the tools you may already use that have machine learning capability, generative AI and its limitations, what dogs can teach us about large language models, how to use AI to categorize expenses, how to deploy AI in Excel, how to improve your prompt engineering skills, generative AI tools, my predictions for the future, and much, much more. This is a visual presentation and you will get more from it if you watch instead of listen. So head over to YouTube if you're not already there by clicking the link in the description. I had a blast presenting this and I hope you have just as much fun listening. Hello and welcome to Tech for Finance, where we help finance pros stay ahead of the game, develop their skills and free up time for the things that matter most using technology. Please like and subscribe. Good. So, Adam, here we are. The final session of the day. And I'm just yeah. waffling a little bit because I know it takes people time to get into the room. I can see the number rising. Oh, the final session of day one of the Global Finance Summit. We've had a brilliant day. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've been in all bar one of the sessions today and I've thoroughly enjoyed all of them. So just let a few more people arrive before we start properly. Um, I'm really looking forward to this, Adam. I've had a sneak preview of your slides earlier on, and I think there's some interesting stuff. You've certainly had your crystal ball out and been gazing as to what's happening in the world of AI at the moment. Yeah, people have a go at me for the... Well, I don't say they have a go at me, but the, the crystal ball is obviously dangerous territory because the rate of change at the moment, I mean, it's impossible to predict, but... It's logical. My predictions are logical. <laughs> so we're going to have this session that's that's predicting stuff. Now, I've got an interesting session tomorrow where I've got uh, Randy Wooden from Maximo and Anil Varapala from Airbase. Both of those are people in, com- in fintechs that are now working out really how to incorporate AI into their technical stack. Mm-hmm. And I think tomorrow those are going to be really interesting sessions because we're going to be going through and talking about the use case for AI and the 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 thinking that they're going through at the moment, deciding whether or not to implement stuff. So that'll give us a great insight into what might be coming up in the future. But anyway, we're here in session six of the Global Finance Summit, day one. Um my name's Kevin Appleby. I am the host for this session. I'm COO at Grow CFO. And I've got with me Adam Shilton. I've known Adam for a long time. Um, founder of his own business, podcast host and consultant, uh, podcaster, tech for finance. Now, I've spoken to Adam on his podcast and he's been on my podcast, The Grow CFO Show. And I'm always, when I, when I want to know what's happening in the tech space and what's about to happen, Adam is always the first person I want to go to to ask the question. So this keynote, we're going to look at AI and machine learning in finance, transformative applications. So how is this going to transform? Now, before we get into the meat of this, I just want to say a quick thank you to the partners. We've got Akila, Airwallex, Macrofin, Agicap and Maxio, all of whom have come together to help us put this summit together and help it help us give you maximum value for minimum cost in fact the cost is so minimal i think it's absolutely free for everybody that's in here today um adam before we get started i'm just going to put a quick poll up on screen uh asking people about ai and machine learning so how do you envisage ai and machine learning impacting your organization's approach to financial management within the next five years Choose the one of those that is most applicable to you. Oh, there's lots of answers pouring in here, Adam. Have we got a trend? Yeah, there's there's one of them is starting to pull away ahead of the others. 
that'd be interesting to see if what you're going to say, oh, no, 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 they've, they've changed, <laughs> changed. It's great because we're, we're not sharing this poll with you yet, folks, but Adam and I, as, as each one of you are clicking, we can see the result changing as it's coming in. Well, okay. you can, Kevin, I can't. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> you can see this as well. Okay. Right. Okay. I am going to end the poll. Most people seem to have answered. So a couple or two or three more answers coming in. Okay. So let's have a look at the result. Okay. So complete transformation, only 13%. Significant enhancements in specific areas like forecasting, risk management, and operational efficiency is the most popular one, but still it's 37%. It's not everything. We plan to adopt AI and machine learning for routine tasks, but maintain traditional methods for complex decision making. That's got a very low score, only 17%. Interesting. We're currently evaluating the potential impact and have not made any concrete plans for integration, 31%. So a lot of people, the jury's still out, Adam, and they're thinking about it. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, hopefully I can get the cogs wearing today, as they say. And having seen some of the slides, you certainly got my cogs whirring earlier, so... Yeah, there we go. I think the question on retaining traditional methods for complex decision making is potentially a, a valid one. Yeah. Um, you'll see why as we go through. But yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a good question. Good poll. I like it. So there we can see the answer. A lot of different decisions there, a lot of different opinions there, well spread over the, the at least four of the five options. And certainly people are still doing a lot of thinking. Yeah. Okay. So Adam, over to you. Take it away. Thanks so much. Right. Let's try and get my slides moving. There we go. Is that switched on okay, Kevin? That is fine. I know you've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to mute myself and let you get on with it, Adam. Fabulous. So hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this session on AI and machine learning, where we'll be de demystifying their applications in finance and giving you some insight on how you can best prepare for the future as well. So in this session, we'll be looking at how I think about AI and machine learning. I've got some use cases that we'll go through, some of the recent experiments that I've been doing. We'll also have a look at some of the tools that leverage AI and machine learning, and we'll have a bit of fun with demystifying some of the concepts as well. So what do I want to equip you with as a result of this session? So knowledge of what's available now, so you can make best use of the AI tools that are available today whilst allowing you to better prepare for the future. You'll have my contact details at the end of the session, so you can let me know whether you came away with what you expected. Feedback really helps me, because next time around, I can make sure that it's better than this time around. So the other thing that I want, to, want you to bear in mind as we go through this session today, you may have heard this quote before, is that AI today is the worst that it will ever be. We recently saw a big move from OpenAI making its latest model free for everyone. So we need to keep an eye out for the way that these systems evolve and keep on trialing, dipping into them and testing as we go. So a bit about my journey with AI. I'd always had an interest in AI pre-chat GPT. So when I was working in the Microsoft Dynamics space, some of the early cloud ERP and CRM systems, they'd have machine learning algorithms to help with things like planning and forecasting. But at the time, adoption rates were pretty low, and getting the best use of the tools was subject to data volumes. Plus, the predictions were never really something you'd want to hang your hat on. The other issues were that some of the best tools were often only accessible to enterprise companies that had you know, deep pockets with very few solutions accessible to smaller companies. But then ChatGPT dropped in 2022, or the end of 2022, and I lost my Christmas to it. I went really far down the, the rabbit hole, and, and Kevin and I have spoken about this before, but I became totally addicted and started trying to put it to use for everything and, and anything that I could think of. And it was nice because it's the first time that I'd seen AI accessible, not necessarily at SME level, but also at a personal level where an individual could increase their productivity without having to invest in a dedicated tool as a business. So I started posting about it, and AI has continued to be one of the hottest topics amongst uh, the guests on my podcast over the past 18 months. 
But one of the common mistakes I see a lot is people confusing AI with automation. The two concepts are fundamentally different. AI is trying to emulate the tasks carried out by a human brain, i.e. cognition and the way that we think and reason. Automation is trying to emulate the tasks carried out by the hands, i.e. steps in a sequence of activities. In its crudest sense, automation is carrying out mouse clicks and keyboard strokes. But of course, when you scale that up to lightning speed, you end up with the modern day applications we use to support and automate our everyday work. But the lines are becoming blurred. You can see that shrinking gap on screen. Generative AI has now taken one step forwards towards automation because it can create stuff, hence the word generative. So getting ChatGPT to produce text is emulating typing on a keyboard. Getting Midjourney to create an image is emulating graphic design work. Getting OpenAI's Whisper to create voice from text is emulating spoken word. And getting Microsoft Copilot to generate code is emulating development activities. Now, right now, my position on generative AI is don't use Gen AI, Gen AI to do stuff for you. Use Gen AI to do stuff with you. This way you can augment your skills and improve your knowledge without becoming over-reliant on it. But there will come a day whereby AI can complete an entire sequence of activities autonomously. The only thing it will need from you is what it needs to produce. And by the way, that day is today. When we look at autonomy, not long after ChatGPT became a thing, people started experimenting with having generative AI autonomously prompt itself. These were termed agents, and platforms like AutoGPT, AgentGPT, Cognosis, they all became hot topics for a really short space of time. In theory, you could set them a goal, and they'd try and work back, creating prompts that they thought would most effectively lead to those end goals. The people realized really quickly that they were pretty bad at prompting themselves. They got easily confused and could cost a fortune if you left them running in the background without supervision because they just go in loops. But recently, a company called Cognition AI released an autonomous bot called Devin. Devin's been labeled as the first AI software engineer. It's still in early access, but so far it's proven the concept and can quite accurately create code and build applications off the back of the instructions it's been given. So we'll have a quick look at Devin. Got a few screenshots. So here you can see Devin create a plan off the back of its initial instructions. So the instructions are to create a map where I can select major airports in the US and see travel time between them. You can then see on the right that Devin has created a set of tasks for itself. We would position these as prompts if we were doing it manually. On the next page, we can see it working itself without user interaction, troubleshooting itself, and fixing errors that it's produced along the way. And then the final step is a little bit of Q&A with the user, just the, far, the final bits of troubleshooting and testing, I guess, before then producing the web page that it was asked to produce. So I can't take the credit for this. This comes down to a dude called Ethan Mollick, who's an associate professor at the Wharton School. Um, he's author of a book called Co-Intelligence, which I've not read yet. It's on my reading list, but I've included some links here, and I'm sure these slides will be circulated after the fact. So do have a look at those resources and follow him. He's very hot on AI in the automation space. But why does this matter to us? So remember that quote that I said at the beginning? For us to invest the right amount of time in AI technology, we, we, only not, we need to not only have an understanding of what's available now, we also need to keep an eye on the horizon, hence the telescope. So at the end of this session, I'll give you some of my predictions that we mentioned earlier on where some of the applications we use every day might be headed. But for now, let's do a deeper dive into AI. So we'll take a step back for a second and have a look at the two main types of AI that I consider to be the most useful for finance right now. So you've got traditional machine learning. Machine learning, or ML, as it's often abbreviated to, is a subset of AI that focuses on the development of algorithms that can learn from and make predictions or decisions based on data. ML algorithms are particularly adept at identifying data points that deviate significantly from the rest of the data set. We call these outliers. And techniques such as clustering, anomaly detection, and neural networks 
can be employed to spot these outliers, but don't ask me what any of those mean. ML also provides a suite of tools for understanding interpreting data. So this includes classification, regression, and clustering methods that can help in making sense of data patterns and relationships. When we move into generative AI, generative AI is a branch of AI that specializes in creating new data instances. Remember me saying it creates stuff that resemble its training data. So it leverages advanced machine learning, a subset of that called deep learning, to produce content that can include images, text, music, and more. This sort of tech is particularly useful for tasks that, uh, that require innovation or some form of creativity, designing new products, simulating stuff, automating content creation, which of course we've seen a lot of. But what do both of these have in common? Pattern recognition. AI does a really good job of giving the impression that it's in cre creating original information, but in reality, it's just filling in the gaps of the data that it's already been trained on. Now, it doesn't matter what type of AI you're using, whether it's traditional machine learning or some of the more modern generative AI tools, they are all trained on a subset of data that informs their responses. So let's look at a simple example, which I've made up. And we're looking at data about fruit. So we can see we've got some fruits on screen. And we have knowledge that we've added into the model. Yes, yeah, so we've got data and knowledge for us to instruct the AI on how to interpret that data, sometimes called declarative knowledge, saying all fruits are healthy. So when somebody were to query that AI and ask, is a watermelon healthy? The AI will process it by looking at the data, a watermelon is fruit, plus the knowledge, all fruits are healthy, to then produce the response that you see at the bottom, watermelons are healthy. But this then immediately leaves us with an issue which may cause bias in the way that that AI responds, especially if the training data is incomplete. So let's take this to the next level. You can see now that I've added another column in for GI value. Now, GI stands for glycemic index, um, something to do with blood sugar spikes. I'm not a nutritionist, so I can't, I can't speak credibly on that. But we can see that the knowledge has now changed to say all fruits are generally healthy, but fruits with a high GI value can be problematic for diabetics. So now when asking the query, is a watermelon healthy, we've got part of the data that says, a watermelon is fruit. We've then got part of the data, which then associates with the high GI value, plus the knowledge that says fruits are generally healthy, but fruits with a high GI value can be problematic for diabetics. And you can see the response at the bottom, which says fruits generally healthy, and then gives a warning if you're diabetic to limit or stop the consumption of watermelons because the GI value is so high. So hopefully that's a understandable example in sort of day-to-day -day terms, but this should also give you a window into how complex training data can be or training AI can be, as well as drawing your attention to the fact that it is not infallible. There could still be gaps in it. So let's pull this back to finance and we'll look at some machine learning in action with some finance use cases. So we'll start with some outlier detection and we're gonna look at a month end journal scenario. So some finance systems now have AI and machine learning built into their platforms. And a good use case is using AI to spot outliers in the data set when it comes to those periodic activities at month end, for example. Nobody likes trawling through lines of transactions to spot where errors have been made. And even if you've got an approval process, you've still got to dedicate time to reviewing and approving. But what if there was a way that AI could help us cut down on this manual admin? So we'll look at this in a similar way to what we did with the fruit example. So you can see here, we've got static data, the data that doesn't change in our system. So we have GL accounts, we have a description of those GL accounts, and we have reporting dimensions that we can apply. We've then got further data that we can use to train the model that includes transaction history of different combinations. So in this instance, we're just focusing on the professional service expenses. We've got an amount for each transaction. We've got a department for each transaction and then a supplier for each transaction. So then when we start looking at overlaying knowledge, 
we can build in statistical knowledge that comes from the training data. So all professional services, sorry, yes, yeah, statistical knowledge that comes from those transactions. So we can see that all professional service expenses from ABC Consulting were procured by the marketing department. We can also see that those services didn't exceed $1,013, which means when we combine all of those that the average amount of past transactions is just over a thousand, should be dollars, but I accidentally hit pounds, sorry about that. We can then overlay knowledge of the way that we set the system up. So we can specify that all transactions must have a supplier and a department assigned. We can set up to say that all transactions that relate to ABC Consulting must be assigned to marketing. And then we can say that new transactions must not exceed 10% of the average amount. So if we look at the, res the response from the AI, you'll see that some of the transactions weren't flagged as outliers, but some of them were. So row three, we've got an incorrect department. So the reason for the outlier is incorrect department. Row four, our amount has exceeded 10%. And row six, we've got an incorrect supplier assigned. But there are issues with this. And this is what we need to be mindful of. What happens if ABC Consulting start working with other departments? Is it still going to flag an error? What happens if we procure a new service from ABC Consulting that doubles their price? Yeah, that's very logical. If they are providing more work, the price could increase. So it's important to know the limitations. And this is also a key reason why human validation is still key. If we look at a further use case of this, I mentioned approvals earlier. If you've got a bot or an AI assistant in a system that's flagging these outliers, it can push it back to the user that submitted the transaction before it goes for approval. So somebody can hit post, whether it's a journal or a PO, and the AI can say, hang on a second, something doesn't look right. Please check this. Are you sure you want to hit approve? So there's some very tangible use cases that we can start using in finance for outlier detection. So let's move on to predictive analytics. Sometimes you might want to use AI for data analysis. And some financial tools and FPA platforms will allow to use machine learning algorithms to build predictive forecasts that go a step further than what you'd be able to manually do in Excel. So it's quite easy to build a simple model in Excel that says, we believe our overall spend is likely to increase 10% next year. But reality isn't that clear cut, especially when you're working with larger data sets where there's an amount of variability in the historic data you're using. So we're gonna walk through a couple of scenarios where we use machine learning with our data. And I have both good and bad examples. So you know we'll learn together. You can, you can learn from, from my mistakes. So I've got a slide here that relates to machine learning algorithms. The key takeaway here is it's important to choose the right model for the use case that you are trying to achieve, yeah? So machine learning algorithms are programs that can learn from data and make predictions in the ways that we mentioned earlier. They can handle complex and large scale data that would be difficult or impossible to analyze with traditional methods. And they can also adapt to changing data. So we've got some common ones on screen. ARIMA stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. It's good for time series analysis to make predictions. Profit is one of the newer models, I guess. It's open source created by Facebook, does very well with seasonality and data that's a bit volatile and you can read up on the others. The main ones that we're using in the use cases that we've got coming up are ARIMA and Profit, but we've got a bit of linear regression in there as well. And as I say, don't worry if you don't have time to read through all of these, I'm sure the slides will be shared afterwards. But I've got a confession to make. I'll let you into a secret. I cheated for that bit. So validate it, you know, do, do what you've got to do. But I used Copilot from within Word to help me break down some of those most common machine learning models. Yeah, so a bit of a use case for AI within the applications that we now use every day. So let's look at my attempts at using machine learning. So as some of you might know, I love having AI produce a bit of Python code for me. So one of the first things that I did. These examples show my experimentation using Microsoft Copilot to produce Python code. And then I ran it using Go Google Colab, which is something called a Jupyter Notebook. Google Colab isn't the only Jupyter Notebook. But I have to give a hat tip to Christian Martinez here 
who introduced me to this concept. Um, I, I think he's done a presentation as well. Follow him. He's really good. So in short, the steps I followed were making sure my data was formatted correctly, you know, data 101, loading the data into a data frame that can then be understood by the algorithm, training the algorithm or the model on my data, assuming that the algorithm and the model does require training, not all of them do. I then ran the forecast and visualized the forecast. But I can hear you asking, Adam, why go to all this effort generating code when you could just use a dedicated tool? Well, I'll tell you. Number one, not everybody's got the budget for a snazzy FP&A tool. And if I get a piece of software to do things for me, I'm not learning anything. Yeah. But in the same breath, there are some open source data science platforms out there, but there is still a learning curve. You know, and you do need to have an understanding of the fundamentals. I don't have a background in data science. So this entire process served as an exercise in helping me understand use cases and having AI guide me through the process. So the first use case is a spend forecast. So this was a data dump from Sage Intact, just dummy supplier invoice data. I had 85 rows to work with, kind of knew it might not be enough, but you know I had to start somewhere. And then in chatting with AI, the first algorithm it recommended was that ARIMA model, which is meant to be good at the time series analysis. So I formatted the data, loaded it into the data frame, trained the model, and then tried using it to make predictions. After that, as you'll see from some of the screenshots, I switched model to see what results would come from different models as well. So here's my data, not complicated, not a ton of columns. As I say, only 88 rows. In this use case, the only relevant columns are the date, which is taking the time series and the amount. So the columns on the far left and the far right. If I wanted to elevate that, I might want to do analysis by department or location, for example, but I didn't have enough data to produce anything of value doing it that way. So here's what happened when I tried using the ARIMA model. Total rubbish. I mean, it would be amazing if my spend was that little moving into the future, but realistically, this was a pretty big fail. So I asked Copilot what it thought, and it suggested that I do an analysis of the volatility of my data using something called GARCH. Again, don't ask me what it means. As the ARIMA model sometimes struggles with big variances in data, and you can see from my historic data there, it's very patchy, it's very up and down. Okay, so when I did the Garch analysis, it spat this out. And this is when the penny dropped, really. This is the moment of realization that said the date is not good enough. Part of the reason is I had much less data in 2019, maybe one of the reasons why the volatility re re um, reduced. And there was less variance in my transactions in 2019 compared to 2018 as well. But I was determined that I wanted to get at least something semi-accurate to visualize a trend. So I moved over to profit which did a lot better, but again, still highlights the issue with the data because it's very unlikely that it's a su supplier trend uh, spend is likely to reduce. Yeah, so just so happens that my data set at the end of it happened to have the least volume and the least value transactions. So naturally, of course, it's gonna spot a downward trend there. But again, just a testament to the lack of volume of data. And then to seal the deal, simple regression analysis to show that downward trend. So I knew I was onto a losing battle really. So the key takeaways from this are, you've got to have a decent chunk of data. There is a learning curve with the models that require training. It could be, that was just my lack of experience with training the ARIMA model. Either way, you then need to experiment with different models and don't hang your hat on any of it, which is why I find that question from the poll interesting earlier on. As a result of this exercise for me, what I do is I do an analysis using multiple models, and then I compare the results of those multiple models to see whether they were all saying the same thing. If you've got different models that are spotting similar trends, then you're likely to be more accurate in your predictions. So let's move on to revenue forecasts. This time, I didn't have any dummy data from an ERP system. So I used Python to generate a load of demo data for me. Python's actually pretty good at uh, generating demo data. So I ended up with 2,000 lines of revenue data. We've got preview in a second, split by customer, region, and product. And for the revenue forecast, I asked the AI, and once again, it said, time series, let's use the ARIMA model. So I've got preview of my data here, customers and numbers. We've got revenue date that will form time series and then the region and the product line. So once I'd loaded the data into the data frame, 
and followed the steps to train it, I ended up with this, which I have absolutely no clue what it is. Yeah, I should probably spend some more time understanding that. But the code didn't produce an error. That was the point. So I continued to try and plot this on a forecast line, on a, on a line chart. And again, it was another massive fail. So I don't really know what happened here. But after some troubleshooting to try and get it to work, I just couldn't get it to work. So I moved on to using Profit, which seemed like it was just going to be a better fit all around for all of my data, not just revenue, but as we saw from the, the spend data as well. But this time I was a little bit more daring. I was a bit stuck for time. So I thought, as well as plotting the revenue forecast, could I also create an interactive dashboard that would allow me to filter by region and by product line using the code generated from Microsoft Copilot put into Google Colab as Python code. And it worked. I literally couldn't believe it. So yeah, maybe a bit of a miracle. Maybe Copilot took pity on me after numerous um, failed attempts. But hopefully this screen is moving for you so you can see what's going on. But you can see the last line of code in Google Colab where the code was run. And then it spat out this visualization, which at the top gives me tabs to filter by product line and region. And then underneath it allows me to zoom in, zoom into the data um, and then pick out parts that I want to, to find more information about. I'll let it cycle around again, just so that you can absorb a little bit more, but it is totally interactive what it's produced. Now, I didn't ask AI to give me a mechanism to share it. But what I could have done is I could have asked it to give me like a, a web URL or, or an embed code, for example, where I could put it somewhere else and share it externally. So you could get to the point where you're using these tools to generate this sort of quick analysis. Yeah, and it might not form part of your month end management accounts or anything like that, but it could form a useful exercise to say, look, I've done a little bit of analysis. Like you might find this interesting. I'm sharing it with you. They don't require access to the data in the finance system. They've just got access to the dashboard. But what you didn't see with this is all of the troubleshooting in the background. So right now, without a dedicated tool and experience in data science, you do need a lot of patience. Yeah, I like doing this sort of stuff because for me, I'm building a transferable skill. If I know what's going on in the background, it will allow me to more accurately guide AI in the future when I'm developing my own models, maybe for my company or building bots or all that sort of stuff. But just a word of warning, the chances of generating code from AI that will run a forecast without you having to resolve any errors is very, very low. Now, a tip that I'll give you that I found quite useful is most AI tools now will allow you to upload images. So what I do to speed up my process, I just take a screenshot, copy the screenshot and paste it into my chat conversation. Yeah, it saves me having to mess around with selecting and copying bits of text and all of that sort of stuff. So I just find it a quicker process. So a little tip there for you as well. But what are the takeaways here? Keep it low risk, do experiment with the free tools. And then if you do see half decent results that come from it, maybe that's more reason to invest in a dedicated tool for this purpose. Or you can employ a data scientist, <laughs> up to you. No, I'm, I'm joking, but you hear what I'm saying, right? So if we look at some of the tools, got a slide here. I've tried you know, to include as many out there, but obviously I've got limited space on a page. So we'll look at business intelligence first. So just be aware that some of these tools might not become equipped out of the box for machine learning. So Power BI, for example, you do have to build in Python to do the predictive analytics piece. Moving on to your ERP and finance software, if you're using any of the above, might be worth speaking to your partner or whoever's providing the software as AI might need to be enabled in the background. It might not be switched on by default, or you might need to procure additional licensing. And then you've got some of the FP&A tools and data science platforms that are on the market. Now, the good news is you might be using one or many of these already. So you can start asking more questions about how can I start making more use of AI as part of my workflow. The last place I'd go to would be the data science platforms, generally better for larger businesses with massive amounts of data. As I say, the learning curve is a lot steep, uh, steeper, but some of them are open source and free to use, like Nine, for example. I've had a bit of a play with that. Um, works well with Excel data, for example. Okay. Really quick, guys. As you know, I don't run ads and I no longer sell anything on here. So to help me, it'd be great if you could share with just one other person, leave a review, give a thumbs up and subscribe. 
it really does make a difference. Now back to the show. So let's move on to generative AI. So we've had a look at some data, and now we're going to be having a look at some of the use cases of generative AI and demystifying some of the concepts that you may have heard um, circulating around. So there's two concepts that I want you to internalize here. So one is generative AI will not produce the exact same responses each time you ask the same question, unless you're using it via an API or if you've got some sort of seasoned prompt engineer working for you, there's going to be variability, which is a term we're going to use more. Generative AI is also limited by something called token lengths. We don't need to go into the weeds in this session. But all you need to know is all of that stuff that we did with those thousands of rows of data, not a good use case for generative AI. You're limited by how much data the AI platform can absorb in one go. It is getting better, of course. So pattern recognition, going back to that concept. Generative AI is trained on a subset of machine learning called deep learning, which we mentioned earlier, whereby massive amounts of data are used to train the model. What you end up with is a conversational chatbot that can fill in the gaps based on the most common responses it sees within its like really massive set of training data. I had Glenn Hopper as an early guest on, on my podcast. So hat tip to Glenn, um, very kind. He took a punt on me. He was the first person to give me the predictive text analogy. So you see this all the time now. AI will try and complete your sentences when you're composing an email. It will try and complete your sentences when you're writing in a Word document. You know, Generative AI is just like this. It's just on major steroids to the point where we're now working not just with text, but images, audio, and video like we mentioned earlier. So let's move on to variability. There's a term when using larger language models called temperature. And this dictates how creative or precise you want the response from the AI to be. Now, you can't set this in chat GPT. The temperature is automatically set for you. You can't change it. But you may have seen in tools like Microsoft Copilot, which you can fr it's free, log in, secure your data. It's something called conversation style. And you can see that on the screen here. So you've got creative, balanced, or precise. This is where you can manually set the temperature based on how accurate you want the response to be. Precise, less variability, creative, more variability. So let's look at a fun example. What do dogs like to do? And I've made up these percentages. So this is a, a thought exercise more than anything else, but I'm gonna prove the concept shortly. So we've got a list of activities that dogs like to do, going for a walk, playing fetch, eating, so on. So if we want the response to be more precise, we'd set a low temperature. And the example there is with a lower temperature, there's a 70% chance that it's going to go for the most common result. With a high temperature, there's a lower percentage chance that it's going to produce that result every time you ask the question. So if we move on to me actually putting this into practice, I asked Copilot this question. What does a dog like to do? Output one thing. So this is in precise mode, the one with the least amount of variability. A dog often enjoys going on walks. Great. Cool. Creative mode. First pass. What does a dog like to do? I'll put one thing. Dogs often enjoy going for walks, which makes total sense because that's the most common response based on the training data. But now when I go back into precise mode again and ask the same question, what does a dog like to do? I'll put one thing. It said going for walks again, which is good because it proves that there's less variability in its answers. Then going into creative mode for the second time, what does a dog like to do? I'll put one thing. Dogs generally love to play, which is a different response to the exact same question we asked the last time, further emphasizing that variability in responses there. Now, obviously this was a, you know, four chats, you know, this by no means proves anything really, but it's nice as a, as a thought experiment. If you don't believe me and think that that was all made up, I did take a screenshot of my chat conversation there. So you can see the timeline and those four separate conversations. So the purple on the right is the creative mode and the blue on the right is the precise mode. So I did do it. I just didn't copy and paste the same screenshots. <laughs> so why is this important? So at some point, you might want to start building bots into your organization that work with your data 
or call specific information from the internet for you. And to do this, you need to decide whether it's a task that requires precision, like retrieving document information or supporting data analysis, or if it's a task that requires creativity, like I don't know, producing presentations or whatever is more creative work you might do as part of your day-to-day. -day. Precise, low temperatures, creative, high temperatures. Now, these are more guidelines rather than hard and fast rules. So you remember all of that predictive analytics stuff we did where I generated a load of code and ran it? All of that was done in creative mode. So in theory, precise mode should work for code because you don't want variability in the code. But I think during troubleshooting, the creative, the creative mode in Copilot enabled it to look at those problems differently and suggest different responses. Whereas I felt in precise mode, it was like banging my head against brick wall. Anyway, so here's an example using Copilot Studio, which I've been going deep into recently. We don't have time to go into Copilot Studio today, but please do message me if you want more information because I think it is going to be a really useful tool because it is built into your Microsoft 365 environment. So in this example, I've set up what's called a conversational bot that plugs into Microsoft Copilot. Users of your team or within your team, so they're using Teams or whatever in Copilot, can interact with your own tailored AI to get the responses back that you want the AI to give as opposed to the generic AI responses. So this could be stuff like uh, contract start and end dates, um, product info. And you can see on the right here, I've got a high level of content moderation. So this is a temperature that says we need the results to be precise. If we are looking at our data, we don't want the AI to add in anything that isn't there. We just want it to focus on that data and recall that information simply. So this bot will trigger when somebody asks a question about customer contracts. It will then look to a SharePoint site to find those contracts, and then it will return the response based on the question asked. What is the start date of this contract? and return it that way. And you can see the prompt there on the right about how we want the AI to interact with the user when they ask that question. But what if we don't have Copilot Studio or any of these WYSI tools that allow us to control temperature? Well, there is a trick I can give you to reduce variability in your responses. All we need to do is give some examples. So we'll look at, I guess, a, a technical AI term. It's very easy to understand, zero shot, versus few shot prompting. So looking on screen here, Excel is to dot, 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 question mark. Would you be able to guess the answer to that question? Now, an AI is not gonna be able to ask it or produce something totally random. And if you were to ask a human that question, you'd probably not be able to answer it either without context. How about now? Are we getting closer? How about now? So what we've done is we've gone from a zero shot prompt that doesn't give any examples at all to a few shot prompt that more or less guarantees that the output is gonna be what we want it to be. And of course, it's just relating the different Microsoft applications to the color of their logos, PowerPoint, orange, Word, blue, Excel, green. So let's look at a finance example, expense categorization. Now, coming back to what I said earlier, I wouldn't try this with massive amounts of data, but you should be safe with maybe tens, hundreds of rows, probably not into the thousands of rows. But here's a tip. When you start pushing the limitations of the AI tool, try chunking up that process and doing segments at a time. I know it's a pain, but if you've got a spreadsheet with a thousand rows, maybe split it into three sheets and ask the same prompts on each of the sheets. Just an idea, okay? But here we have some example expense descriptions that might be difficult for an AI to categorize if it doesn't know your specific naming conventions. So evening meal with a customer could be everything. You know, you could class it as meals. You could class it as subsistence. Whatever your terminology is, it doesn't know. It's the same with overnight stay. Is it lodging? Is it hotel fees? Is it fill in the gap? So when we then apply the few shot approach, where we have prior data that we can use to train the response to say, if it contains lunch, it's subsistence. If it contains overnight, it's travel and lodging. If it contains breakfast, it's subsistence and, and so on and so forth. You can see how the response is going to be consistent with the terminology that you use. Now, if anybody's noticed my Greek project names, I've got a fun fact for you. 
I have a tattoo sleeve on my left arm completely devoted to Greek mythology. It's where I got the inspiration from. So that project Icarus, I've got a tattoo of Icarus flying into the sun on, on my chest here. So fun fact for you. I'm actually going to Crete in Greece next month with the family for the first time uh, with my one and three year old. So wish me luck for that. But anyway, let's move back to the plot. You can now start building this exact AI capability into Excel using labs generative AI. Now, the example on screen, it's, it's not a finance example. I mean, it could be a finance example if you're doing a data cleanup of your customers, but you can see how this set of formula instructions in Excel is training and providing guidance on where the response needs to be. So the blue box here shows the badly formatted names. The red box is something that somebody's typed in to say, this is what the naming format should be. The green box then selects the new data that the AI needs to fill the information for. And then when you hit enter, fortunately, I haven't got the output of this, it will continue to fill those lines based on the red box that you've seen at the top here. Now, this is really useful because this is where that cognition piece comes in that we mentioned earlier. Be incredibly difficult to create an Excel formula that accurately reformatted all of those names. Whereas for an AI, if it can spot the pattern, coming back to that you know, word again, pattern, it can do that cognitive task for us. So you can download AI labs for free, plug it into Excel, have a bit of an experiment. There's loads of YouTube videos on it. But again, you can see another area where the few shots that we have used within the, the blue and red boxes then inform the output from the AI once we press enter. Now, what have we been doing here? Without realizing it, we've been training a model to our specific requirements. It doesn't matter whether it's you know, Copilot Studio or AI Labs in Excel. This is a very similar process to what a prompt engineer might go through if it's ensuring that a large language model is equipped with the knowledge that it needs for a specific task. So when you create a custom GPT in ChatGPT, you're training the model. When you create a Copilot in Microsoft Copilot Studio, you're training the model. The next iteration of this is not having to train the model manually. So what we've just run through there is manually training a model for a specific purpose, but tools have now started training themselves. Now I'm not talking about training the model. You know, there was always the issue with ChatGPT whereby platforms like OpenAI would use your data to train the model and use that data across the entire platform and then roll that out based on the training data to all of its users. Here we're talking about I'm we're talking about specific training for your individual version of the AI tool. So if you've not seen ChatGPT now has a memory function, it's not been rolled out to everybody yet, so you might not see it yet, but it will use your previous conversations to train itself on the things that you talk about the most often and provide more useful results to you. My prediction is that this same concept will start making its way into other tools as well to the point where they'll train themselves on your data and your company processes without you having to do things manually. So do watch this space. The screenshot that you can see here does have some example training data. It's one of the open IA screenshots. You can delete out the things that you don't want it to remember. Not sure how laborious this will be. I'm not sure how much of your data it picks up, but personally, I wouldn't want to be hitting delete every afternoon to whiz out the data I didn't want, but you know, I'm sure it works very well. Now we're going to move briefly into, and for anybody that's not techie, please don't, please don't leave the session. Um, but I think it's it's useful as an exercise so that you can see what's going on in the background. For those that do want to get a little bit more into prompt engineering, you can access the backend tools for platforms like OpenAI and Anthropic who provide the Claude model. So I'm gonna assume that most of you have at least used an AI tool, whether it's ChatGPT or Google Gemini, but there's now tools in the backend that will allow you to have a play with temperature. So at the top right of this screen, you can see the temperature control, which again, as we said previously, controls how precise or creative you want it to be. And then you've got the token limitations at the top there. Now we'll talk about tokens. But if you are a developer using AI in the background, it costs you money every time you trigger an API call. So if you set that token limit to only produce a smaller set of data every time it answers a question, you're reducing your cost because you pay per token. 
So again, this might inform your discussions if ever you're speaking about a tool where they pay per usage, you know, and if there's any discussion around you pay per token usage, this will inform that discussion for you to understand a little bit more about what tokens mean and how they're consumed. So the two platforms are um, the playground that you can see here from OpenAI. So that's platform.openai.com. And then the other one is console.anthropic.com, which doesn't refer to it as a playground, refers to it as a, as a workbench. But if you were to go into Anthropic, and this again is another recent update, you can use a tool called Generate a Prompt. And this is probably more useful for, for the non-techies on the session. You can just provide in simple language, this is what I want an AI to do. Can you help me create a prompt that's going to get it to do what I want it to do? So you don't have to think about prompt engineer or anything like that. And it will spit out a really well-crafted prompt for you. Prompting AIs to create prompts. This is the world that we now live in. Absolute madness, but absolutely fascinating. So I said we talk about token lengths, and we're coming to the end now. <laughs> Stop listening to me bang on about all of this sort of stuff. I could go for days. But I mentioned at the beginning of this section that one of the limitations with generative AI is that token length. So how much data it can consume in one go. Models now have token lengths of, I think it's about 200,000, which seems like quite a lot, but it's really not, especially when you compare it to when the tool was first released. So common limitations I see, ChatGPT not being able to produce... Um, to process large documents well. That's where that chunking exercise comes in. Copilot in Excel, not being able to handle spreadsheets with large amounts of rows. Again, it's a token limitation. And then hitting limitations when you're just chatting day to day with AI. So have you ever found this when you're having a long conversation with ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or Google Gemini, and the longer you have the conversation, the worse the results appear to be? Now, it's getting better, but that is something to do with token length, I'm sure. Again, I'm not a developer, so I can't say for sure, but these are some of the limitations that I'm seeing. So remember what we said at the beginning, AI is now the worst that it is ever going to be. So we will see improvements probably within the next six to 12 months, maybe sooner, depends. So the token lengths will get longer. We'll be able to work with larger data sets more easily. So what are the takeaways here? Make sure that you have total awareness that you're going to get a varied response from generative AI and deploy those tools and ta tactics that we use in few shot, zero shot prompting to make sure that the responses are more accurate if you don't have a temperature control. Deploying apps in Excel, if you're using Microsoft Copilot in Office, um, helps um, with cognitive tasks on small amounts of data Yeah, for now. So if you're going to try and do that sort of stuff, try and chunk up your larger data sets to account for those token limits. So let's have a quick look at the tools and then we'll do my last bit on predictions before we'll, we'll leave you. So general purpose chat bots, we've been mentioning them as we've gone along. Remember, tread carefully with these general purpose tools, especially if they're free, because one, from a data security perspective, if you're using free versions, there's a chance that they'll use your data to train the model. So always check. And number two, they are trained for general assistance. So make sure that you do have semi-decent prompts in providing context so that you get the best possible outputs. Now, looking at the fp &A tools on the, the bottom left, we're now seeing generative AI creep into lots and lots of applications where you can use natural language to Q&A data, produce visualizations, and speed up your workflow. So we've got data rails there, um, FPNA Genius, I think worked as the, the adaptive planning, just to, to name a few of the subsets of those um, applications. Pyramid Analytics is an interesting one, one that I discovered recently. Not only can you use Gen AI to Q&A data, you can talk to it. It'll automatically create complete dashboards for you. And then you can take it to the next step to take those dashboards and it will create a presentation for you. And then you can share that with, with the rest of the business. So we can see where all of this is going, less of the manual stuff, more of the automation. Now, from a finance software ERP perspective, you'll start seeing this more and more. So Sage recently launched their Copilot, which is a, an AI assistant that will be built into the Sage applications. Oracle NetSuite uses generative AI, I think, for stuff like when you're sending out documentation so it can personalize, um, say, emails that it sends out so it's more relevant to, to the customer. 
Dynamics 365, obviously we've spoken about Copilot um, and Puzzle, um, really cool application, A out the core, more for startup type businesses, but I thought I'd I'd have a more of a scrappy startup example there. And then you might also find that there's some other niche tools that you come across. Now, I'm not an advocate of just finding as many tools as you possibly can, because then that becomes very unwieldy. But if you do stumble across a tool for a specific use case that's easy to adopt and has some really quick wins, then there are a plethora of other applications on the market that can serve different purposes, whether it's modeling, whether it's automatically creating um, Google Slides for you based off your data, whether it's pulling data from multiple places and giving you a bot that you can chat to all of those different data points from different databases, this is the way that we're going. Okay. So we'll finish up by having a look at my representation of what things look like now versus my predictions for the future. In the earlier part of the presentation, we introduced Devon, but I think we're likely to see the same across other platforms. So I've picked almost at random three different applications that you're probably the most familiar with. So ChatGPT, Power Automate, and Excel. Now, I didn't deliberately give Microsoft a lion's share of this, but they're just easy examples to use. So if we look at ChatGPT when it was first released, it was okay, but the responses were pretty poor and they could be really inaccurate. Now the model's improved dramatically to the point where we can use it as a very capable AI assistant to augment our work, to support a lot of the tasks that we do every day. The next iteration of this, I believe, is gonna be more autonomy where we don't have to prompt as much. We don't have to hold as long conversations. We can just say, I want to produce this outcome and then the AI will prompt itself yeah, without you having to get too involved in that prompt exercise. Next example is Power Automate. So we used to have to build flows manually and there was a high learning curve. Power Automate used to be called Flow, by the way. Um, we now have Copilot for Power Automate where we can use natural language, you know, so create me a flow for this and it will put together a basic flow for you. So that reduces the barrier to entry if you're not, you know, a Power Automate user. And then if we play that forward, it could get more advanced and I can't guarantee this, but it could get more advanced whereby you don't really have to do the building anymore. You can just give that output, it will do the building in the background, and then it might just be a Q&A to test it and make sure that it's working. So we then switch to an outcome-based methodology rather than a manual step-by-step -step methodology. So our ability to think critically, our ability to guide, our ability to have that vision for the future is going to really help once the AIs become more autonomous. Now, lastly, the tool that we all know and love, Excel. In the past, we'd have to do everything manually. Now we can use Copilot to augment our skills when it comes to you know, creating formulas, tables, and charts. And as we mentioned, it will even support analysis on small data sets. But in the future, we might be able to instruct Copilots to autonomously build entire worksheets for us and help us glean insights from much, much larger data sets. We're already seeing hints of this with Copilot for Finance, which is a specific plugin. It's free, by the way, so just Google, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say Google, should I? Just search for um, Copilot for Finance, plug it into Excel. It does a reasonable job at just doing a, a reconciliation for you. So you just point it at two sheets and it will do a comparison and and outline those reconciliations and the, the variance and the balance at the end of it. And it's being geared up to help with the data analysis piece and ties it maybe to that outlier concept or that variance example that we, we talked about earlier. So... That's where I see things heading. Now, the last concept that I want you to take away, and you've, you've probably heard this throughout other conversations or other presentations that you've had today, is this concept of repurposing versus replacement. Now, I appreciate that there might be the usual fear that says, is AI going to replace my job? There are no end of these conversations, obviously. Part of it for sure, and I'm excited about that. You know, The less I've got to do manually, the better. But if you do spend 100% of your time on admin tasks, then yeah, then there is a chance that a large portion of that is going to be replaced. So what can you do instead is the question. But I will always take the positive standpoint. The more work we can automate that doesn't bring value, the more we can focus on work that does create value, we should leave the repetitive stuff to the machines and we should leave the fun stuff to us humans. 
I'll leave you with that thought. Anyway, we'll finish up. Feel free to contact me, connect with me on LinkedIn. Go to techforfinance.com. You'll see my newsletter, my podcast, all of that sort of stuff. And then go to Think as well, you know, if you want to start, you know, more of a system assessment, ERP, you know, that sort of type discussion. Check out We Are Think and I'll, I'll speak to you there. But really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you bearing with me as I've um, talked at you for the last <laughs> 50 or so minutes. Um, but yeah, hopefully that was a useful session and I've really enjoyed the opportunity to speak to everyone. So thank you. Adam, that was absolutely fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed all of that. I must admit, some of it was floating over my head. I want to go back and look at some bits of it again, but you certainly prompted my interest no end. I'm looking forward to be chatting outside of this session to you on lots of things. I must admit that lots of things that I've discovered about AI in the past few months have been as a result of looking at your posts on LinkedIn, some of the stuff that you're putting on Tech for Finance. So actually, those links that Adam has just put on screen, I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend them to you all. Adam is one of the great teachers in this area, how to use AI for practical things. And the results of Adam's playing with this stuff, I think is just incredible. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Got one question. Go on. Only one that's come up, and we're gonna that's all we're gonna be able to go for because we have actually just about run out of time. Uh -huh. You answered it already, but Hani is asking, can I integrate Chat GPT with Power BI to make Chat GPT work in my data set stored in Power BI and give answers and analytics based on my data? So the simple answer to that is no, if you're not a techie. So I mentioned previously the ability to create GPTs, so bots using chat GPT. Within GPTs, you can create things called actions, and you can build in code within that bot to connect via API to other stuff. But to somebody who's not a developer and hasn't written any code, that is going to be very difficult to achieve, but happy to pick up the conversation if you want to dig deeper. The path of least resistance with that, and I don't know whether it's been released yet, but there are co-pilots for Power BI that are built into the applications. So have a look around that. There are already Q&A tools that you can have within Power BI as well that allow you to do a chat GPT style chat conversation. But yeah, right now, unless somebody's already created a bot for it, have a look, search Power BI GPT. It might be something that comes up. You will need somebody with experience in coding using those bot actions to connect chat GPT to anything else. Hey, I knew that wouldn't be a simple answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not the answer people wanted to hear, but I'm happy to Once pick up. again. I'll, I'll do the same after because it's very, very much. That has been a fantastic session. Uh, we've got six more sessions lined up tomorrow. There'll be loads, loads more. But once again, Adam, thank you. And we'll just bring this session to a close. No worries, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Catch up soon. Hey again, and thanks for listening. If you enjoyed what you heard today, don't forget to like, review, and subscribe. And for more goodies, head over to techforfinance.com. See you soon.